as uh, boarded in head and neck surgery and facial plastic surgery, uh, skin cancer reconstruction has really been a very big part of my practice uh, since I left residency, as, uh, as I know that it is for a number of other people in our group. Uh, we love our sun. And there are people that actually love wearing uh, leather shoes to the beach and short <laughs> nylon socks as well. Uh, the tanning effects of the sun have some wonderful short-term benefits. Uh, they also have some long-term problems that they induce, such as uh, in this 39-year-old man seen leaving a club at 6 o'clock in the morning in West Hollywood the other day. The degree of photo-aging, the uh, dyschromias of the face, the uh, exaggeration of fixed and dynamic wrinkling and creasing in the face, uh, vascular fragility, all of these things are direct uh, effects of solar exposure. There are some that are more nefarious though. Uh, here's an example of this nodular telangiectatic lesion of the right lower eyelid that is actually growing into the conjunctiva uh, of this gentleman. And this is a nodular basal cell carcinoma, uh, which is going to, if left unattended, create visual problems for him, but is going to be a reconstructive problem in any case. This is the result of cumulative sun exposure. Uh, just as is squamous cell carcinoma. But there are other behaviors that, uh, that start very early in life that may expose us to individual severe sunburns, and those create different kinds of histologic problems later in life. Melanoma in particular, which is capricious, and has a uh, tendency to metastasize in sometimes unpredictable ways. It has a very uneasy stalemate with the immune system so that many years can go by and then at a moment of immunological uh, defensive uh, defenselessness, then all of a sudden something crops up which could be a life-threatening problem. These lesions actually can be linked to individual bad sunburns and not just to cumulative solar exposure over life. There are a number of available skin cancer treatments. Uh, many of these are time-honored uh, and have taken their place in dermatologists and primary care offices, as well as uh, those in various surgical practices. Uh, acid peels, liquid nitrogen, electrodesiccation and curatage, which is basically scraping and then using uh, low amperage uh, electrical stimulation to desiccate the surface. Those things uh, are effective for superficial skin cancer lesions and uh, are done by the millions every year. Uh, there are topical treatments for frequent flyers, like 5-fluorouracil, uh, which uh, uh, under different brand names can be applied as a topical treatment for a couple of weeks. Uh, the patient looks like hell during the time that that's on, uh, but then as the recovery from the application resolves, uh, there's a marked improvement in pre-malignant and in early stage malignant cells in the skin. And for somebody who's just devastated by the kind of solar uh, aging and, and photo damage that that previous gentleman had, uh, this, this can be a, a well-used, uh, effective treatment. 
Uh, excisions with or without frozen section control are very common in our offices and in the operating room, depending on the size of the lesion. Uh, ionizing radiation uh, has been used for a long time. Uh, it absolutely uh, can be curative for uh, certain skin cancers. There are concerns uh, about depigmentation of the skin, uh, thinning out of the skin, making it uh, less resilient to trauma. Uh, but one of the other uh, concerns is that uh, after time, ionizing radiation has been shown in cases to induce secondary cancers, whether they're uh, epithelial or sarcomatous. So while it may not happen frequently, it's definitely a concern. Uh, almost everybody in this room probably has heard of the term Mohs surgery. Uh, Mohs excision, or microscopically oriented histologic sections, is a way of trying to excise a lesion so that all aspects of the contact surface of that growth can be histologically evaluated and determine uh, if there's any residual tumor left behind. Uh, immune modulators uh, are coming to the fore for advanced or unresectable disease. Uh, that'll be a topic for future discussion. Uh, Mohs surgery, while it has that uh, it has that uh, abbreviation that's been put into practice. It actually was originated by a general surgeon in 1932 named Frederick Mose Jr., who in the Midwest uh, was surrounded by people of Germanic and uh, Swedish background, and uh, they didn't tolerate environmental exposure very well. They would get a lot of uh, extensive skin cancers. And so he came up with a, a method of actually fixing the tissue in situ. So he would have the patient, or the patient would have the zinc chloride and bitter root paste applied to the tissue. It would actually fix the tumor where it was. So it didn't matter whether it was on the back of your hand, on your skull, uh, on your chest. Uh, and once it was fixed, he could then come back and literally just carve it off. It's like going to Foga to Chow and getting, you know, getting that meat carved off on your plate. He would then have the specimen flipped over, mapped out, and anywhere that there was a residual area of tumor, there would be more application of paste, it would get fixed, and then carved off. This could go on for a long time. I've seen, uh, I've seen some of the final pathologies on patients that had chest wall lesions where myocardium was present in the final clearance specimens and a number of cases where there was brain present as the tumor was followed right through the scalp, the skull, the dura, and everything in between. So it was a very effective way of, of getting rid of some massive problems, but it took a long, long time. So uh, that was modified over time. Dermatologists uh, really embraced this technique, and some specialized dermatologists who are trained in doing Mohs surgery would then utilize frozen section evaluations to try to speed this up. Uh, actually, when I was in training in head and neck surgery, we used Mohs techniques for, for following the pathology of upper aerodigestive tumors. So we would take tongue, jaw, neck specimens out, and we would do the same kind of analysis of, uh, of the contact surface of these tumors, and we could trace nine cell wide cords of tumor four or five centimeters, you would nev never have any idea that this was going from the larynx up into the nasopharynx. And it would take 14 hours to do these cases, but the cure rates were remarkable. 
The other thing that was remarkable is how much the pathologists hated us because they would have to stay until 3 o'clock in the morning to finish the cases off. Uh, one of the things that, that's especially important with Mohs is that in the face, there are certain areas uh, where embryologic fusion planes collide with each other, like tectonic plates, and tumors that develop in those fusion planes have an opportunity to dive deep, unsuspected to the clinician. So in areas near the medial canthus, along the side of the nose, uh, the central upper lip, and around the ear, uh, the recurrence rates for excision of skin cancers in those areas is much higher uh, because of this ability of tumors to go in rather than stay on the surface or relatively superficial. So this is one of the great applications of Mohs surgery. Also in areas where the, there's very little available tissue, like on the tip of the nose, the eyelid, things like that, uh, Mohs may allow us to trace out tumors and, and preserve some adjacent tissue. There are some surgical tenants that are important in designing reconstructions for skin cancer. Uh, there are relaxed skin tension lines in the face, uh, and if one uh, orients an excision along those lines or closes a reconstruction along those lines, the uh, results tend to be better. On the right side uh, is a map of the aesthetic units that are perceived by observers. When, when we look at someone's face, we see depressions, uh, we see uh, high points, ridges, sulci. Uh, those are expectable topographic uh, landmarks. And we then, if we can place reconstructions into these aesthetic units, uh, avoid crossing from one aesthetic unit to another, or place scars in the boundaries between, uh, we will get superior results. There are a number of challenges of facial reconstruction. Uh, we, like all animals, are highly attuned to very small imperfections in other people's faces and in our own. Uh, the portals to the eyes, ears, and mouth uh, are complex orifices. Uh, they are made of multiple different kinds of tissue. It could be skin, uh, alveolar uh, tissue underneath, cartilaginous tissue, sometimes bone. So uh, to restore all, all of those things and to get natural looking results and contour restoration is a challenge. Uh, movement in the face, as Dr. Kochar very well demonstrated, is supremely important. And we do have the ability to uh, preserve sensation and motion if reconstructions are planned out properly. Hair bearing areas, obviously, uh, you can't take hair bearing donor tissue and plunk it right in the middle of the face. Uh, I remember seeing one patient in the clinic as a resident who came in with a kind of an unnaturally curly looking mustache. And I looked at him oddly for a minute until I realized that a previous plastic surgery service had taken an inguinal skin graft and repaired his skin, you know, his facial skin cancer with it. So we want to avoid those kind of mistakes. Uh, so these, uh, these examples will show some of the problematic scarring that occurs if we don't pay attention to relaxed skin tension lines, if we don't pay attention to aesthetic units, uh, if we don't make sure that if we're close to a vital structure like the eyelid or the corner of the mouth, uh, that that our reconstruction is going to supply enough tissue 
so that we can support those structures and avoid distorting them. Uh, the nose on the lower left shows a skin graft, which is leave, leaves a depressed and unsightly uh, result. And uh, scars that cross convexities are much, much more likely to be uh, visible. So uh, I'm going to uh, cut through a few of the things that have to do with uh, flap design and uh, categories other than to say that we're looking for soft tissue that has its own blood supply that can be kept intact so that we're not transplanting devascularized skin from one location to another, tends not to have the same color and texture match that we might want, uh, but we can harvest tissue that has different levels of vascularity and contains uh, skin, skin and subcutaneous or fascial tissue and or muscle tissue uh, that can be left attached and then uh, moved into an area of need. There are a lot of different geometric designs which are very, uh, very well thought out and ingenious. Uh, sliding tissue along a linear axis is called a horizontal advancement flap. We can flip tissue from one location over intervening skin. Uh, so I'm going to get to the holy part of this talk. Uh, the holy part has to do with some uh, bad defects that happen in the face of very good people. Uh, this lady on the far left uh, has a large defect from squamous cell carcinoma that was excised. Uh, with proper planning, a transposition flap from the right cheek is used to fill the defect and support the lower eyelid and uh, also gives her satisfactory protection and function. Uh, this lady has a much more complicated defect that takes the part of her, the side of her nose and her upper lip off along with part of the cheek. She also has a large flap that mobilizes the entire right side of the face uh, from the jawline and then uh, will we'll reconstruct all of those areas. Uh, one ingenious flap that was devised 2,300 years ago by a cast of Indian pot makers. Uh, it was designed to uh, take care of the, the social uh, predilection for amputating the noses of uh, women that were uh, thought to be, well, uh, thought to uh, take their sexual prowess in places that it shouldn't be. Uh, so a flap was designed from the middle of the forehead that could be turned around, brought over the upper part of the nose to deposit tissue in the lower part of the nose. Uh, here's a nasal defect that's small enough to be grafted with a, uh, a graft that has skin and cartilage from the ear on one side. But when you get bigger defects than that, then you need a lot more powerful tools. So here, uh, this man has lost most of his nose on the right side, his upper lip, and his cheek. Uh, I reconstructed his cheek with the transposition flap and his upper lip as well, and then secondarily brought a forehead flap down to rebuild his nose. Uh, this lady, uh, who is obviously very well put together and uh, has uh, lots of friends and lots of important places to go, she wound up with a devastating uh, defect in her cheek on one side. Uh, if you look at the lower right, you may be able to barely detect the line that goes from the upper part of the chest along the hairline up behind the ear. So the entire neck and her cheek on that side was rotated up as a flap to resurface the entire side of her face. Uh, the aesthetic units 
uh, become very important uh, in the central part of the face where uh, this young woman had a skin cancer defect that uh, took out uh, a lot of the tissue in her upper lip. She actually did much better by me removing the remaining part of the skin in the aesthetic unit and then sliding her cheek medially and replacing the entire upper lip on that side with one continuous reconstruction rather than a patchwork approach. Uh, uh, lip defects, another uh, full thickness defect. This is devastating because it took the muscular function of her lip out as well. Uh, she had the inside of her lip uh, reconstructed and also a flap of uh, nerve and muscle that brought her uh, cheek and, and lateral lip muscle to the midline and then the outside of her lip were reconstructed with a cheek flap. Uh, so she maintained her aesthetics and also uh, function of the mouth. The last case that I'll show is also another devastating defect with the entire compound uh, defect of the nose. She has no cartilage uh, or any internal lining of her nose as well as the external that uh, affects her lip and her cheek too. So this is with her median forehead flap in place, brought down from the center of the forehead. A lip flap slid up to resurface the lip and her cheek brought over to the nose. The second stage divides the forehead flap, leaving the forehead tissue on her nose and turned to the inside of the nose to reconstruct the internal lining. And that's her ultimate result at about three months. So long story short, our very best friend is the ozone layer. Our next best friends are zinc and titanium oxide uh, for, uh, for using that as protective topical treatment, umbrellas, hats, sunglasses, and other sunscreens. There are new frontiers that are going to change everything that I've been talking about. Uh, face transplantation is already in practice, so more limited versions of those kind of free flaps will, will be used for facial reconstruction. Stem cell population of biomorphic frameworks to grow new organs is already in development. We will be using 3D printing with biological substrates to print tissue directly onto human bodies. It's going to happen within 10 years, and uh, I, I hope to uh, be along with uh, Amit, one of those people that's uh, doing some of that printing. So I uh, really appreciate your attention, and uh, let's all imagine what the next 2,300 years will bring.